Hey there, my name is James Lee. Welcome to another segment of 5149 on Breaking Points, where we dive into different topics at the intersection of business, politics, and society. And today, I want to talk about Boeing. We've got some breaking news now concerning United Airlines and Boeing. Want to get straight over to Phil LeBeau, who's got that news. Phil, good morning. Good morning, Andrew. This is a massive order by United Airlines with Boeing. Here's how it breaks down. A minimum of 200 airplanes are being ordered, potentially up to 300 airplanes, and 100 of them will be 787 Dreamliners. 100 have been ordered with an option to order another 100 of them. They will also be ordering 56 737 Maxes and exercising the option to take delivery of another 44 Maxes. All together, as you take a look at shares of Boeing, these 787s are part of a massive increase in the production rate. It's currently at about one, but they're going to be bringing that up to four and then five starting early next year. Recent Boeing news, massive orders for Boeing aircrafts, both the 737 Max and the 787. A healthy jump in stock price. Very good news for Boeing shareholders, Wall Street, and presumably good for their customers as well. The United States Federal Aviation Administration issued an airworthiness directive for all Boeing 777 airplanes. Boeing 737 MAX aircraft has experienced six mid-air emergencies and dozens of groundings in the years since it was cleared to fly again after two catastrophic crashes. 60 other mid-air safety incidents have also been logged by flight crews in US government databases. Well, maybe not so good for passengers. That news is from this summer. Very concerning news about the safety and airworthiness of Boeing aircrafts. So is it not concerning or is it not just a little bit odd that at the same time when shareholders in Wall Street are very pleased, we're also getting news like that about aircraft safety, which is not so good for customers and passengers. And that incongruence is what we're going to explore today. To do this, we're going to need to nerd out for a second and talk about this one metric that Wall Street loves. It's called ROA, Return on Assets, described by industry analysts as, quote, the most effective, broadly available financial measure to assess company performance. It captures the fundamentals of business performance in a holistic way, looking at both income statement performance and the assets required to run a business. Very effective, so they say. And the formula is quite simple. It's a company's income divided by its assets. A fancy way of saying how much money do you earn by selling your goods and services divided by how much money you have to own to make what it is that you sell. It's not super complicated. I do know that Wall Street and business executives try to make business strategy seem complicated, but oftentimes if you just sit down in meetings with some of these guys, they boil things down to maybe one, two variables max, and they go, tell me what I need to know. I'm being measured by X. So how is this decision Y going to impact X? And in this case, a little bit of role playing, I would say something like, well, you can improve ROI by pulling a couple of levers. One, you can sell more planes, which boosts the numerator. Or two, you can try to lower your assets by outsourcing the manufacturing of the planes, which reduces the denominator. And that is what they've been doing over the past two decades at Boeing. The 787 Dreamliner, which they started working on in the early 2000s, is all about asset light design and manufacturing. Take a look at this jigsaw that is the Dreamliner on your screen. The wingtips, for example, are outsourced to a company called KAA in Korea. The fixed trailing edge is from Kawasaki in Japan, and the horizontal stabilizer from Alania in Italy, so on and so forth. We do not have time to go over every single part today, but the design is a doozy, and I know engineers, if any of you are watching are probably thinking right now, complicated piece of machinery like the 787, not too uncommon to outsource components to external suppliers, which is right. But the kicker is that Boeing didn't just outsource the manufacturing of parts, it turned over the design, the engineering, the manufacturing of entire sections of the plane to some 50 strategic partners. Boeing itself ended up building less than 40% of the plane. If you're an engineer or work in engineering, comment below, is this a good idea or not? Boeing's popular 787 Dreamliner is facing a new manufacturing defect, which might sound familiar. This is another blow uh, for Boeing. The defect could take three weeks to address, which means airlines won't be receiving Dreamliners in time for much of the busy summer travel season. 
We first reported about the Dreamliner issues in September when the FAA launched a high-level review of Boeing's Dreamliner manufacturing processes. In two weeks' time, we saw two cases of battery failures on the 787 and the grounding of the entire fleet by the FAA. Unimaginable that we could be three years late, have a fleet grounding, have fires on the airplane. They're shortchanging the engineering process to meet a schedule. There's no doubt this bad repair is going out the door on the 787. That is just a sampling of the news coverage over the past decade about the 787, and that is the plane that hasn't crashed. And probably the most telling quote to sum this all up, I'll read it to you, it's from the New York Times, quote, managers told employees to install equipment out of order to make it appear to Boeing executives in Chicago, the aircraft purchasers, and Boeing shareholders that the work is being performed on schedule, where in fact the aircraft is far behind schedule. When it comes to making planes, those would be some obtuse incentives in place. Managers at the manufacturing site being basically forced to lie to executives in Chicago, lie to their shareholders, lie to the customers. The Chicago point I'll come back to, but my point is it's kind of a house of cards. And if you ever look at that seat pocket uh, in front of you to see what kind of plane you're flying on, you might do so going forward. Like I said, we've been lucky so far that these planes haven't resulted in any fatal accidents but uh, we don't really know what the future brings, and it's obviously a risk corporate executives are willing to take. An Indonesia passenger plane crashing into the sea minutes after takeoff. 189 people on board. On October 29th, 2018, a Boeing 737 MAX 8 jet crashed into the Java Sea, killing everyone on board. The origin of the MAX scandal has its roots in the rivalry between Airbus and Boeing. Ever since the 1990s, the two companies have been locked in competition. By the 2010s, the commercial aviation market was essentially a stable duopoly, with each company controlling roughly half of the market. At the heart of this rivalry has long been each company's flagship commercial passenger plane. For Boeing, that aircraft is the 737. For Airbus, it's the A320. In 2010, Airbus shook up the market when it announced the A320neo, an updated version of the A320 aircraft line. Neo planes wouldn't just be updated versions of a familiar aircraft, they would also be cheaper to run. It's time to think max. Boeing did not design a completely new plane from the ground up because it would have taken too long. To make the max, Boeing took the existing 737 airframe and paired it with a new, more powerful engine. But doing that changed the plane's aerodynamics. One effect was that in rare flying conditions, the aircraft's nose would pitch up. This is where the MCAS software came in. It was designed to automatically push the plane's nose down. One former Boeing engineer who didn't work on the MAX characterized the software fix as a Band-Aid. We've been learning for the last year how the, the Band-Aid wasn't as strong as Boeing needed it to be. Okay, that's another risk the executives were willing to take, this time to maximize the numerator of the ROA metric, their competition Airbus. They had come out with a new plane that airlines might prefer better. So they took some shortcuts, engaged in arguably some fraud to build their own plane in a very short amount of time to make sure the company's revenue wasn't gonna be impacted, knowing full well the risk and consequences in hindsight almost too well, right? We now know that they went through a little bit of a rough patch, a couple of crashes, sales, stock, they both dropped for a brief period, but nothing they couldn't or didn't come back from because these people, despite my critique, they understand the game better than most of us, and they play the game really well. Where does Boeing stand on why those MAX crashes happened? There are investigations that are still ongoing there, you know, but certainly what we've done is we've looked and we've said, what are the things we can do to really um, 
improve all our safety processes. And we've taken a number of actions there. Al Madar, Boeing's Chief Aerospace Safety Officer, points to this newly released safety report, which highlights the steps the company's now taking to bolster the safety culture inside the walls of Boeing and on its airplanes. Well, the purpose is really to put a very structured process in place that's data-driven, that really takes on safety in a different way. We learn from our mistakes, we're better for it, we're taking actions, we put processes in place, we're using data, safety is our ethos, yada yada. This is a headline back in 2000 about a Boeing strike, but to give some context, after Boeing merged with its rival McDonnell Douglas in 1997, whose leadership wanted to run Boeing, quote, like a business rather than a great engineering firm, the employees at Boeing, all 40,000 of them, tried to fight against this cultural change culminating in a 40-day strike that shut down production in 2000. One union leader said, quote, we weren't fighting against Boeing, we were fighting to save Boeing. The engineers, they saw this coming over two decades ago, and that Boeing, in my opinion, was probably the last vestige of a Boeing firm that was focused solely on good engineering. Referencing this headline, the leadership basically said, screw that. And in the following year, 2001, they moved the company's headquarters from Washington, where the majority of the planes were being manufactured, to Chicago to deliberately distance the finance side of the company from the engineering side. So it's not so important to listen to what people say, but more important to observe what they do. Corporate leadership saw engineers as a threat to the company's new culture, their new way of making money, so they isolated them. Now, looking at this recent headline, the FAA does not expect to certify the Boeing 737 MAX 7 before the end of the year. The acting head of the FAA said Thursday he does not expect the agency will certify the Boeing 737 MAX 7 before a key deadline at the end of the year. Boeing is seeking a waiver from Congress of a December deadline imposing a new safety standard for modern cockpit alerts for the 737 MAX 7 and the 737 MAX 10. So today, Boeing is facing a new threat to its profitability, this time not from engineers, but from a reinvigorated FAA, rightly so. The FAA is trying to impose stricter safety regulations on Boeing, which they aren't ready for, and therefore their lack of compliance could delay the launch of their latest jet, the 737 MAX 7 and 10, decent chunk of their sales, which could have downstream implications on their shareholders. A lot of people are looking at the next two weeks and they're saying you've got the 737 MAX 7 and 10 certification deadline. If a waiver is not in place by then, people originally were saying, that's it, Boeing's going to throw in the towel and they're not going to build these planes. What, what happens if there's not a waiver in place by the end of the year? Well, first, uh you know, uh, in this case, I think we have to all be careful not to put too much weight on the deadline itself. Deadlines are not good for cert. That's the point. They're not good for the regulator to get its job done. They're not good for us in trying to certify that airplane. So we simply want that, that date to go away. They want that date to go away. A little bit of a gaslight, obviously, because they say deadlines are bad for regulators because they should have ample time to do it, which is true. But... They also want their planes to fly in the meantime, prior to being certified under the more stringent new requirements. This is from literally this year. Boeing plans to move headquarters to Arlington, Virginia from Chicago. Aerospace giants move to Washington, D.C. area would bring senior executives closer to federal decision makers. That's maybe one way you can get that date to go away. Similar playbook as in the past. Let's move the company's headquarters now to a stone's throw away from D.C., having the ears of the FAA or other lawmakers who are actually trying to do their jobs by overseeing what Boeing is up to. But unfortunately, that's the business, that's the game, and that's the truth about the clashing of safety and financial considerations at Boeing. Engineers, you can sort of ignore them. Passenger safety, you can recover from that for the most part, as we can see. But shareholders and other risks that would impact the financial considerations of the company, and we're talking about maximizing financial returns. These companies are all profitable. At the very least, they're not in danger of collapse. Those considerations cannot be ignored. That is all for me this time. I hope you enjoyed today's discussion about Boeing, about return on assets, about financialization. If you did, I would encourage you to check out my YouTube channel, 5149 with James Lee. I have tons of videos and breakdowns on many different topics like this one. The link will be in the description below. 
Of course, don't forget to also subscribe to Breaking Points. And thank you so much for your time today. Hey, guys, ready or not, 2024 is fully upon us now. And Sagar and I have been brainstorming ways that we can really up our game for this critical election. Yeah, we rely on our premium subs to expand our coverage, to add staff, to upgrade the studio. We just want to give you the best independent coverage of this election, which is possible. So if you can help us out, become a premium subscriber today, breakingpoints.com, or the link is down here in the description video. It really means the world to us. And if you like what we're all about, out. This is the best possible way to keep us 100% independent, working only for you.